I'm Father Mitch Paqua, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. No empty claim. Our guests tonight win the Long Distance Award because they come to us all the way from Australia to discuss how we can contradict the secular culture and find true significance in our lives by doing God's will, staying in close relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ through the sacraments, and allowing Him to transform our lives every day so that we can be awake in Christ and not be led astray by the wokeness of today's world. So, please welcome tonight's guests, Sharbil Reich, Kevin Bailey, and Robert Haddad. Welcome. Thank Good you. to see you again. Thank Welcome you, back. It's good <laughs> to have you, Shadabel. <laughs> Welcome to Father both Mitch. of you. Good to have you here with us. Um, I'm going to, um, first of all, uh, deal with why this is an issue. And, you know, I've been to Australia twice in the past years. And Australia is a place that is becoming very has become very secular sure would that be correct uh, absolutely mm. and the, it's not only secular but it's also a society where your citizens are very very dependent upon your government you know, for a lot would that be a, a fair statement as Definitely well heading that way. there's a lot more social services there's a lot more um, you know, the safety net is getting um, bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So our government spending is getting bigger and bigger and our government debt is getting bigger and bigger. And so... How about your taxes? <clears throat> taxes are going up all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think in, in that way, I think we're more of um, a socialist system, more of a social democracy. Um, and a lot of people like it that way. They, they, they think that it's important to protect the you know, the uh, underprivileged or people who aren't doing so well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important in any society, but then it's a matter of balance. But when I was in Australia, I, it seemed to be a, connect, a cultural connection between the increasing uh, safety net of the state yep. and involvement of the state in everybody's personal lives and secularism. Mm. They seem to go together the, uh, because the, we don't want to favor any religion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't want that to be part, you know, we're just doing this to yeah. help people out. And, uh, but it pushes religion out of the schools and other areas of life. Well, we saw that with the COVID lockdowns. I think Australia was uh, one of the worst in, in relation to lockdowns. Where I live in Melbourne, um, we had one of the longest lockdowns of any city in the world and uh, the government's promising to keep people safe and people went along with that. So that really shows there's a bit of a psyche um, of not relying on, you know, um, on divine providence, not taking that risk, which we've always historically been a bit of a risk taking, you know, happy go lucky uh, sort of culture. Yeah. And, you know, it's a little bit sad that that seemed to um, go into the background a bit over the last few years. Well, again, I was going to say that that I've known Australians mm. since I was a very little boy. Yeah. My dad worked for an Australian company back oh, wow. in 52. Wow. Uh, to, to 57. And so we had lots of Australian friends. And I always think of Australians and Americans as being very simpatico mm. in, you know, culturally, not just in relatively close language, but... We're Texans with accents. <laughs> <laughs> with respect to schools, um, about 38% of uh, students in primary and secondary schools go to non-government schools. And the non-government uh, areas are very strong. And about half of that 38% are in Catholic schools, uh, the others in... Uh, Anglican schools, they're elite schools, most of them. Then there's the non-denominational sector, which is growing, but also there's a growing Islamic and Jewish sector when it comes to schools. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised to know that um, 
we still have catechists, lay catechists, volunteers going into pu the public school system. Okay. And that's very strong in New South Wales mm -hmm. and still somewhat strong in Western Australia. But over the last decade, both in Queensland and in Victoria, Victoria which have <coughs> very left-leaning state governments, they've abolished that. Yes. So the struggle that we face in New South Wales in particular, because I'm from New South Wales, so I have some awareness of the issues, is to maintain that. Uh, when Cardinal Pell was Archbishop of Sydney, he was very surprised to see how strong our catechist system was in the public schools, and he was determined to keep it strong. But there's always those forces, like the unions in the public schools, who want to eliminate all religion from the public schools. Yep. Yeah. See, that's... And the yeah. reason I mentioned it, that same kind of cultural thrust has been going on in Canada, yep. and it's probably the most advanced of the English-speaking world, I, mm. I, at least the, 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 the former colonies. Yep. I don't know England uh, at all, but uh, we're moving in that direction. That's where this issue of being woke comes in. Mm. Uh, what got you three interested in looking at the First of all, what do you mean by woke mm -hmm. culture, and what got you interested in doing this? Yeah, people losing trust in the in the typical systems that they're familiar with, We're losing trust in history, losing trust. So that they've got this new term, wokeism, or, or being woke. They're awoken now; they know the truth. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing the, the ramifications of that. So what we're trying to do is say, no, wokeism is sort of. Uh, being opposite to what the fullness of truth is. It's, it's, it's rejecting absolute truth, objective truth, and it's, it's starting to segregate people. It's starting to put people against each other. And this is not the way it's supposed to be. So, yeah, yeah. we're trying to reawaken people. What got me interested was having kids. <laughs> and Satan is trying to take our kids away from us. And um, Satan is very deceptive. He uses all sorts of people and all sorts of systems and and so what's happening is um, as our society is becoming more and more secular and the lies, the twist in the tail, it's, um, it's really, you know, it's like rat poison. Um, uh, and um, rats eat rat poison because it's 95% yummy rat food. But it's only 5% it's only poison. And so there's such poison in what the world is teaching our kids and it's getting worse. We've seen that change happening over the last... 15 or 20 years, and it's just mm. accelerating. And so, uh, as a parent, you know, parents um, have to step up and start speaking the truth, and we have to sh declare that as Catholics. We have to, sh you know, uh, share the truth. Uh, the world is looking for the truth. The world's looking for answers in all the wrong places, looking for love in all the wrong places, and we know the truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ, and we want our kids to know that and our grandkids. But in order to do that, as baptised Catholics, we have to stand up and proclaim the faith. We can't wait for someone else to do it. So mm. that's what got me interested. And I know Chabelle's got nine children. I've got seven. And Robert, you've got four, I think. Well, four, yeah. Four yeah. living. I've had, we've had yeah. some Under his keeper, mate. Yeah, What's the matter with you? I know. We tried. We were all natural. <laughs> we followed the church's teaching. <laughs> but I got into this issue because I'm an educator. Mm. And wokeness denies the reality of objective truth mm -hmm. or the, the discover, discoverability of objective truth. And basically he says there's no objective truth and there's no even objective reality. We create mm -hmm. our own truth and our own reality. So this endeavour of wokeness to create new terminology and redefine words and deconstruct everything, deconstruct marriage, culture, society, uh, even the church's teaching. So that's why I'm worried about woke culture and its, uh, and its in, intention to indoctrinate the next generations in this denial of, of objective reality and truth. Yeah. Do you, uh, in this country, we've, we, there was a Marxist professor named Howard Zinn who wrote A People's History of America. Mm. And it was, as is not unusual with Marxists, it was loaded with falsehood. He would take a partial quote from one, uh, say, for instance, the, uh, one of the most famous was the uh, diaries of Christopher Columbus. He'd take a quote from one page and put it with a quote from a different day, a different situation, as if they went together when... 
in fact, Columbus was saying the opposite of what Zinn claimed. And this is the standard history book used mm -hmm. in public schools. Do you have that kind of falsification of history going on? Well, what what I see at the moment, at the moment yeah. in Australia at the moment, the debate that's currently happening and has been happening for decades really is a rewriting of history in the sense that European colonization and the British influence was all bad. Mm -hmm. And we want to yeah. jettison that and we want to move forward to what really is a cultural Marxism or a de-Christianisation of society. Yeah. So yeah. that's what's happening in Australia. And we've got an issue right now regarding a referendum, which is, and some of these issues are, are, are being raised in the debate with respect to this referendum yeah. in the next few weeks, which mm -hmm. relates to a change to the Australian Constitution. So, yeah, that, it, that is happening. But it's not just... You know, British, it's Western civilization, it's mm. family, it's church, it's all the things that we hold as true. And um, it's been happening so incrementally and so slowly that we've never noticed it. It's a bit like the analogy of the boiling frog, where you put a, a frog into a saucepan of water and it could jump out, but it doesn't because it's comfortable. And you put it on a stove and turn the heat on, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. But it's so incremental we don't notice it. I think over the last few years, uh, we as Catholics have found that um, we've put up with little incremental steps and we think, oh, it's not worth raising an issue about that, it's not worth making a fuss, and then step by step by step, and eventually it's going to kill us. Yeah. And, and we become our own worst enemy. When we become comfortable, we become fat and lazy, and then um, that's when we start losing the faith. And young people particularly are looking for something to lay their life down for. We want, you know, they want to be challenged. They want to actually, you know, um, have something that's worthwhile mm -hmm. making sacrifices for. And Jesus didn't say be safe. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we need that challenge. And that's what makes us human. And that, that, uh, that's what makes us real. And that's what we have to focus on. One, one mm. of the points I noticed that's parallel to our country also is that... Uh, even back in 94, my first visit, sure. that a lot of young people were choosing not to get married. They might have a baby together. Mm -hmm. The state will give them a support. place to stay mm -hmm. and support, uh, and they don't have a need to marry and support each other. Um, is that still the case? Sure. There's that breakdown of... Um, the number of weddings that are happening, people are not getting, if they are getting married, they're not getting married in the church. Mm -hmm. And um, and people have this attitude of, you know, that young young people are, um, think it's pretty weird to wait, you know, to get married, to, um, to have sex. Um, mm -hmm. People think it's weird, you know, that you don't need to get married. And so um, we've got, you know, marriage breakdown, all those sorts of things that are happening in America, they're happening all around the world. And because people are being told lies, and yet the truth just seems, you know, sort of um, too difficult. Now, the three of you mm. are working in Australia to speak counter to this. Uh, Sharma, I want to start off with you. What, what have been some of the efforts and what do you see in terms of successes and not so successful or even failure? Yeah, good question. Um, I think more recently we've been seeing giving people, going back to basics. So we're finding even adults uh, are missing the very basics of our faith, the very simple Absolutely. Catholicism mm -hmm. 101. So I've been busy. Uh, yeah, just and I would just say, too, uh, same here. Yeah. Yeah. When I taught at university, I would test my students mm. and say to write out the Ten Commandments. Mm. They might get one or two. That was it. Yeah, the majority, far majority don't know the commandments. No. Little, you know, not in order, let alone any, you know, maybe half of them. But then even just the overview of the Bible, the overview of salvation history. Why did Jesus even come to die on the cross for us? Why do we need a savior? These very basic <clears throat> questions, um, we're not able to answer them. And therefore, we're, we're missing the link between why we are here, who made us, why we're made, and what's the purpose of this life. So we've got to go back to that sort of real basic, those real basic fundamental questions. Yes, that's it. And yeah. you yourself, I, I listened to you give a, a talk at... Uh, our parish, St. Elias, here in Birmingham, and you talked about how you had to move from being very successful, mm. uh, as you described yourself as the sure. Dave Ramsey of <laughs> uh, Australia. I mean, you, you do financial consulting sure. on a national level. Yeah. Um, 
but success doesn't really hold up well against significance. Sure. What did you mean by that? Well, how, um, you know, I'm the world's oldest teenager. You know, I'm still trying to work out what I'm going to do when I grow up. Mm -hmm. and, and so really it's what, what's the most important thing to be doing with our life? What's our purpose? Um, and it struck me um, when I want my kids to actually be practicing the faith. If I was just going along with the flow, going along to church and being involved in my faith, you know, um, living in the world, being successful, trying to be the most successful in everything that I did, but really just going along to church, we need to be in the church going to the world, not in the world going to church. And so for me, um, it really is um, a matter of um, my kids and, and lots of our young people think, oh, mass is boring or, you know, it's just, you know, the, the, we're managing decline and, and that's not attractive for young people. And so for me, what was really important was to, to really work as a, as a lay person to really inspire and to actually um, lift up our faith and to share the faith with people. So I got involved with uh, Father James Mallon and Divine Renovation. And uh, the whole idea of this ministry is, is parish renewal. It's about moving people from maintaining the flock, from maintenance to mission. And so focusing on bringing hope to priests, life to parishes and people to Jesus. And that's something that is worth getting behind. So I've worked with Father James. I'm now involved with that in Australia. I've been working with um, Charbel and Perusia Media, providing the resources so that we can equip people to know their faith. We can inspire people uh, to get involved in their faith and we can connect them with others that are involved in their faith. And so, you know, the, the three keys are that we need to uh, be embedded in prayer. We need to have a strong prayer life, adoration, the rosary, uh, going to Mass, you know, daily Mass if we can, um, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But the second one is leadership. We need really good leadership in our church. We need to have men step up as well as uh, women. Women are doing most of the heavy lifting. So it's up to us men to start getting more involved in our faith and being an example to our kids and to young people. And uh, so leadership is really important and focusing on helping priests to be better leaders of their parish. And then the third thing is, is to be missional, to be hospitable, to be welcoming others into our, into our church, into our parish. And so the Catholic parish should be the only club in town that exists for its non-members. So we're always trying to, you know, just be a club, but it's not about us. It's about the community. It's going out and making disciples. Well, yeah, signs of hope. I, I work in, um, in a big Catholic school system. There's 152 schools in the Archdiocese of Sydney. So what I see are positive, positive movements, and this has been going on incrementally in the last couple of decades, is that there, there is a hunger for scripture among teachers, and there's a, a revival in a desire for spirituality and prayer. And I was very surprised when I began in my role, the desire for, you know, uh, the attraction of Eucharistic adoration is strong among young teachers when we take them on retreat. And that surprised me. But I also see signs of hope in the number of uh, teachers going up the ladder and assuming leadership roles, particularly as religious education coordinators. And they eventually will rise up the ladder and be uh, APs, assistant principals and principals. Also, in addition to that, what's happening in the school system, there's been a great revival in the number of vocations to the priesthood in the seminaries and religious life. And the vast majority of those uh, people joining religious life and, the, and seeking the priesthood, they are Orthodox and faithful Catholics. And I've seen a transformation in the area where I live. All the priests in the area around where I live are now faithful Orthodox priests. And one other stat I'll give you is that I was at a meeting earlier this year of religious leaders in our schools and secondary schools. And I, there was about 80 leaders in that room. And I decided, I got the impulse, count how many of them in this room I know to be faithful Orthodox Catholics. And the number is 30 out of 80. And you might think, well, that's, that's not a majority, but that's a lot better than where it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the leadership in this Sydney Catholic School system is determined to continue the legacy of Cardinal Pell. Mm -hmm. He really began this revival yeah. back from 2001 onwards. And the current Archbishop, Anthony Fisher, is perpetuating that. And, and they're real signs of hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was despite Cardinal 
Chappell being falsely accused oh, yeah. mm -hmm. of a sexual abuse mm. and after living in prison for, was it? 405 two, days. 405 mm. days. Falsely accused mm. and charged. And, and in <coughs> uh, solitary confinement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not able uh, to say the mass? Nope. Nope. And then was fully exonerated with by our a, Supreme Court. With it was the High Court of unanimous. Australia. It was seven unanimous. Seven to nil. Seven it was zero. the most. You know, that's in, seven to nothing in English. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Two countries separated by a common language. <laughs> yeah. the, if you read the judgment of the High Court of Australia, it would take you ninety seconds to read it, which meant basically the High Court of Australia was saying this should never have come to trial. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's no facts could support the allegations whatsoever. But I, I think that this brings up another element, that those folks who would oppose having Catholic influence, they'll say, well, you know, we want to be open-minded, and some people would like to be Catholic and believe that there is such a thing as objective truth. Well, that's okay, and we'll just believe that it's... They're not that way. No. They are they're, not. They're anti. They are mm -hmm. not saying, well, some people would like to get married and some people don't, so we'll just live and let live. They are not live and let live. You have the same they opinion as me or we will destroy you. Yes, they're aggressive. aggressive yep. this in opposing changed, Christ, yep. mm -hmm. his church, the holy sacraments, the scripture, Ten Commandments, Sermon on the mm -hmm. Mount. They don't like any of it. Well, during the COVID lockdowns, the churches were considered as non-essential. Yes. And that there were basically, when restrictions came in, the first restrictions came in upon the religious houses, the churches, etc. And they would be more locked down than casinos, or even sadly to say brothels. Or big and, bottle shops. Yeah, or big bottle shops. And big bottle shops. Yeah, Never at that stage, liquor, but churches liquor weren't. Shops. Yeah, so like alcohol. Liquor, alcohol shops. liquor stores. Liquor yeah. stores. Yeah. Again, yeah. we have to translate yeah. into and when, American. And when it came to lifting the restrictions, it was often the case that the churches were the last to be have the restrictions lifted. Mm. This was true in states like Michigan, and California yep. as well. Mm. That, you know, the police would, uh, if people gathered at a church, police would go and take their uh, license plate numbers yep. and identify them. You, bet. Uh, mm. you know, uh, in, I know they did that in Michigan. And, but marijuana stores and liquor stores, uh, or <laughs> bottle shops, uh, <laughs> in translation, um, they, uh, were kept, they were allowed to be open. Mm. And this shows <coughs> to me that in their secular mentality, mm -hmm. keeping the people buzzed and high is safer for the secular mentality and for governmental control of thought than is hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the hope That is, would be my sense. I don't know. Yeah, that yeah, absolutely. It's become more hostile now than ever. I remember growing up where we did have debates with non-Catholics, but we were still able to play in the playground. We were still friends. We would have robust debates, but still be able to go to each other's place, still be able to talk to each other. And, and so this has completely changed now. We're, we're noticing more and more people, if, if you don't agree with me, then I'm not going to talk to you anymore. If, and this is where it's gone way too far. Well, again, it sounds to me as if you, uh, in this secular environment uh, it, there and here in, in America, um, we see that the only way they can deal with, you know, disagreement is by canceling you. Mm. Yeah, but they picked on the wrong guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is really waking people up. People at last are starting to say enough is enough. So we're starting to get people, you know, have been searching for what's the truth or what's the meaning of life. You know, people asking these questions have been giving the wrong answers. They're starting to wake up to the fact that there are lies. And so, quite frankly, it invigorates me that we've got an opportunity to push back. And in fact, we can actually be doubling down on, on what we're doing and, and preach the truth and mm -hmm. preach it in love, you know, and, be, and just be very proud of who we are and what we are and what our identity is, is our identity in Christ, not in all these identity groups that they try to put us into, which is, you know, which is cultural Marxism or it's, it's meaningless. It, Mm -hmm. It pushes people away. It doesn't solve any 
problems or answer any of the questions that people have got, where we need to be a bit more bold and a bit more um, out there. And, and quite frankly, it, um, it's a lot more fun. So we don't need to be thinking, oh, woe is me, it's all going terrible. It's all, you know, it's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, not under our watch. It's time for us to step up and stand up. Got to get out there. Yeah. One of the points that you've brought out is how the lack of faith in truth, that the, they don't believe that there is uh, an objective truth, or if there is, nobody can discover it. Mm. That's mm. the standard position, mm. correct? Yeah. Uh, and w the irony of that always is, if there is no objective truth that exists in between us, then our discussion is impossible. Mm. Yeah. We have no basis mm. of truth upon which we can build an argument that makes a bridge between us, like mm. you were talking That's about right. before. Mm. You know, That's when right. you could disagree, but still get along. And when that happens, I've been saying this for the last 20 some years, that when they do that, the only way for the, them to win an argument is by might. Might makes right. Mm -hmm. That's all they've got mm -hmm. because they can't base the arguments on the merits of the facts. Mm -hmm. They, well, you're wrong and I'm right and I'm in charge, so you shut up. It's, and and it's that's even got yeah. to about more than that, Father Mitch. Got. It's feelings instead of facts. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you can actually have all the data and it's meaningless. They're not interested in the data. They're just interested in, in how they feel or what they want, and then you have to actually agree with them. So, you know, it's not, it's not tolerance, it's celebration. Yep. And so if you don't celebrate what they want you to celebrate, then they have to cancel you. Yes. Yeah. A recent example of might is right happened a few months ago in the Australian Capital Territory, which is like your Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's a and separate federal yeah, territory right. where the and capital is. Yeah. There was one Catholic hospital there that provided excellent health services, except for abortion, euthanasia, etc. The government of that territory is very left and green, and they just decided to legislate to confiscate that hospital, to take control of it, to rip it out of the ownership of the church, and they took it over. And within hours after passing the legislation, they sent in the machinery, the trucks, and they just... The crane and took yeah, out the cr yeah, cross. Destroyed the, the cross, yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. a statement an aggressive statement that we have taken this, it is now ours, and they use the euphemisms. Now this hospital will provide adequate health care, total health care to all and sundry. But that is, uh, f the, f the bishops of Australia have raised an argument against that, a storm against that. I don't think the governments are listening. And why we are worried is that this creates an a very serious precedent. If they could just seize a hospital, then they could seize other things in the future, schools. particularly schools. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And we've experienced that back in September. Uh, uh, former President Trump was on trial and the judge basically seized all of his property in New York, mm. devalued it, and not even Mr. Trump's family can manage it. It's just taken out of his control. And when forces in the government confiscate the property of an opposition political candidate, it's the same situation. You can do it to anybody. Yes. This, this was happening in third world dictatorships, I thought. I know. <laughs> oh, well, boy. Yeah. This is where democracy, you know, human beings are very resilient, but structures in society are fragile. Yep. And that applies to democracy too. We're gonna to take a break, we'll come back with this discussion and start talking about what are some of the things they're doing in Australia as models for us to take a look at in our own society. So please take, stay with us.
Hi, welcome back. We are with three guests tonight. All three are from Australia. Wonderful, wonderful country. If you do get a chance to go to Australia, I certainly encourage it. It's a beautiful place. Uh, but with us tonight are Charbel Reich, Kevin Bailey, and Robert Haddad. Uh, two of them are Maronites. Robert, yeah. you are Maronite. You're uh, father's from Lebanon? That's right, and my mother. And your yeah. mother. Yes. And Sharbel, you yeah. also are Maronite? Your yeah. Yeah, parents? My, my great-grandparents went to Colombia. So my father and grandfather born and raised in Colombia, South America. But they came originally from, from Lebanon. Lebanon. Yeah, on my dad's side. My, my grandmother's Colombian, yes. but my grandfather's side is yeah, Lebanese. And your and mom's Lebanese. Lebanese. Yes. And Kevin, yeah. your family Seven is Seven generations not. Australian. Yeah. So, um, um, Irish is um, is Irish is falling in love with an Amlock Bailey. Yeah, yeah, I figured <laughs> that it might be. Yeah. Now, we, we've pointed out some of the difficulties going on in Australian mm. society, but the, I'm certain that the Americans and Canadians will recognize their own societies. This is something happening yeah. uh, throughout the English world, mm. and I suspect it's going on in other kinds of cultures as well. Mm. Uh, we're all the recipients of uh, 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 English common law and an English language and culture, and, um, but, but it's beyond that English-speaking world. What do we do about it? So I'd like to, uh, and I know that's why you're in America, you're talking <laughs> about what, what's going yeah. on, what's succeeding, mm. and some of the wonderful, wonderful changes taking place. Uh, there as it is here in this mm -hmm. country as well. So, Sharp, I'll start off with you. Yeah, it's, it starts off, if you remember, I've, I've, you interviewed me uh, during COVID about my testimony. So I fell away, I was a lapsed Catholic, fell away, influenced by Islam and then came back. And the, the biggest thing was, I, I was challenged about the Catholic faith and none of it made sense to me, because I never studied it. And then I, I was missing all the connection between who God is, what the church teaches. So when I discovered some great resources, the CDs back, they're, they're sort of dying now, <laughs> but CDs, yourself, your own CDs, reading books, uh, I, I was fascinated by how everything is linked, the Old Testament and the New Testament, what the power of the sacraments are, what's happening in the mass. I was just falling in love with our faith. There's so much to it. I discovered EWTN, I remember uh, 22 years ago, and I remember watching the programs back then, and just I just consumed it. I was hungry for more and more and more. And that just led to sharing this. I couldn't bottle this up. I, had to con I couldn't contain it. It had to go out. And so I think it always starts with your personal conviction. If I'm not personally convicted by this, well, I've gonna ha I'm going to have really not much hope in convincing someone else. If, if they mm -hmm. see in my life, I'm not taking my faith seriously. Well, why would they listen? Mm -hmm. So getting to know the faith yourself, because the more you know God, the more you know the truths of the faith, the more you fall in love with him. And then the mm -hmm. more you fall in love with God, the more you want to get to know him. And so it's like this spiral that just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and or it's been beautiful. if it goes the other direction, it gets more and more shallow. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. You so, know, I mean, that really is the yeah. it's yeah. a choice. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you, got, you can end up like the apostles who were not all that committed to Jesus in Gethsemane and ran away yes. when the danger really came. Uh, they didn't stay and pray and... When trouble came, they were gone. That's right. So you you, you got to make a choice yes. uh, as to what you're going to do. That's why formation is important. So that's why learning as much as we can, Bible studies, learning the catechism, learning the church's teaching, and and we we would do this in a number of ways over the years. At Perusia, started off in Sydney, we're bringing out speakers like yourself, and you remember when there were thousands of people coming out, just hungry to know the reasons why behind our faith, and so we would record them, we would put them online, we would make DVDs and CDs and then we'll publish books. So that was a really big part of our apostolate. And that then sort of led to then study groups. And a lot of people wanted to do study groups yep. and some great uh, uh, places in America doing great work, Ascension Press, Augustine Institute, St. Mm -hmm. Paul Center. The, these guys are doing wonderful work and we promote their material. And I'm seeing lives change because you journey from, from one, week one to week eight and you see their transformation. Mm -hmm. And you, you might have a group of 30 or 40 or 50 and these are adults and many of them grandparents as well. And they will say, how come I didn't learn this all my life? How do we get our grandkids back? And it, I never get sick of seeing all these people who are a good generation ahead of me, two generations ahead of me, 
and, and, and saying, wow, I've le- they're like a child again and they're learning the faith and they're discovering it in a whole new, fresh way. It's wonderful. So, one, yeah. One point on that too. I saw, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s and I saw that about 1968 in this country that people stopped teaching much content Mm. in the catechism. Mm. It was more about forming community and being... Social justice. Yeah, Mm. yeah, but not even that so much. At first, mm. just forming a a bond (coughs) and community and making collages. Singing Kumbaya. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Whereas, uh, and so people didn't know the the, the faith. Was that, would that yeah. be that in our country as well, definitely at the same time? Definitely. 60s, 70s were, were like so, that, yeah. yeah. So, thank okay. God um, there were people in small groups around Sydney doing something, and I was to learn on them, and then we started to expand. And when Kevin and I united in 2014, it just went, it just grew tenfold, yeah. uh, thanks to Scott Hahn <laughs> recommending me to him, and uh, the rest was history. But we've been taking things to the next level, knowing that people are hungry for more. We've launched an academy during COVID, we call it the Perusia Academy, and we're going back to basics, the meat and potatoes of the faith. Introduction of the Sacraments, which is taught by Deacon Harold Burke Sivis. It's an awesome, yep. awesome course. Uh, we've got Introduction to Apologetics, which is taught by Dr. Robert Haddad. Introduction to Christology from Dr. Paul Morrissey from Campion College. Science. And the list goes on. So we've got uh, so many speakers, Father Robert Spitzer. We've got, um, we, we've got Father Edward John Flutter, Dr. Edward Tree filming right now. Um, Chris Padgett on evangelization. I mean, the list is growing. We're about... 10 courses now and and we hope to grow that uh, continue for teachers for any adult <coughs> wanting to learn their faith and we're offering a certificate for mission because we need to raise the next leaders we yeah. can't only rely on bringing uh, the best of the best from america we've got to also grow them ourselves and yes so when yes. we do that i think we we fulfill christ's last command go make disciples and the other part of that is then we here in America will start bringing the best of Australia over here. <laughs> That's like why we're we already <laughs> doing. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. I, um, what, what, what do you see yourself, what, what are you yourself doing in this re-evangelization? Yeah. I, I, I get on the sidelines, get frustrated. You know, the church seems to be in decline. Nothing's happening. Um, my kids are saying mass is boring. Um, um, all that type of thing. Um, it came to a head when um, one of my kids said he didn't want to go to church anymore. Wouldn't happen in America, but it happened <laughs> happened to me. And uh, that uh, was the catalyst for me to say, hey, um, I was living my faith, I thought, but I was really just involved. It's a bit like the bacon and eggs, um, you know, where the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed. Um, I was being a chicken. And um, I needed to be a pig, and and I needed to surrender my whole life. If I wanted my son and my and my um, all my kids, my daughters, to follow the faith, I needed to be an example. For too long, we've left um, um, our faith to our wives and and um, and women, um, you know, passing on the faith. And and in fact, us men need to stand up and be counted. So I that happened to me back at about 2010, 2011, around that time. Um, and um, thanks be to God, my kids, you know, are following um, the faith because I, I had to really get serious about it. And so I walked away from um, all my career and, and started focusing on, on faith development. I thought, OK, Lord, I'm just going to do whatever you ask me to do. And I, I got involved with Chabelle and uh, Perusia Media. But I also met Father James Mallon that I mentioned just a moment, uh, moment ago. And, and he was very concerned about the same sorts of things happening in Canada. He wrote a book called Divine Renovation. And he was sharing what was happening in his parish in Nova Scotia. And um, I became good friends with Father James. He eventually asked me to, um, to represent uh, this movement in Australia. And so I've been involved with them for a number of years now. And what I'm seeing is that we're working with good parishes and making them better. And so I've actually seen the fruit of that is starting to blossom. And it's happening all over the world. It's the fastest growing parish renewal um, movement. It's not a program. It's not. A, it's not a um, ministry. It's a ministry that's supporting parishes to to really get stronger. And we're seeing parishes turn around from being beige, bland, um, you know, sort of just declining. And with the age of people going to church is getting older and older, to where young people are getting involved and where people are are getting excited about their faith and sharing their faith. So for me, that's been something that I've you know really gotten behind in Australia and New Zealand, there's a bishop in Christchurch, New Zealand, <clears throat> called Bishop Michael Gillen. And there's a new bishop 
in um, Palmerston North, a diocese in New Zealand, that is uh, just full of um, the, the hope and the uh, belief that, that you can make a difference. We've got um, a number of priests, you know, in, um, in Australia, in Perth, there's Father Pier Luigi, there's uh, Father Chris Ryan in Sydney, that these are guys that have really developed their parish and they've changed the focus of their parish from just maintaining the flock, you know, the maintenance of a declining, you know, parish into one that's actually encouraging people, all baptised people. Pope Francis told us in Evangelii Gordium, you know, to go make disciples. And so that's now become a huge focus of the church in Australia in a whole range of different areas and different parishes. And we're seeing enormous um, change that is happening. And it, it's really quite exciting because um, our faith is something that um, is, has to be really central for it to be meaningful. And um, it's changing people's lives. And we're seeing um, people come alive in their faith. We're seeing parishes transformed. And so um, from a desolate desert, um, in, in many areas, we're seeing these, these shoots of uh, growth and greenery and, and it's just blossoming. And I think that by focusing on really good parishes, what happens is in the neighbouring parishes, the, the guys look over the fence and they say, wow, what are they doing? And um, <clears throat> I want to have a part of that. And so increasingly we're seeing um, this renewal. So I don't believe that God's going to um, just let us decline in the West. I believe that the heart of Jesus is for everyone to know him. And we just need to pray and we need to actually align ourselves with the heart of Jesus. And I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, I just think this is an exciting time to be Catholic. Yeah, I, mm. I would agree. Our Lord is not going to just let the church go, but he's always going to give an invitation. Yep. And you can either be like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, yep. leave your nets and boats and come follow, or you can be like the rich young man mm -hmm. who couldn't. Yeah. So By the was, way, we don't, know his, we don't know his <laughs> name. No. And, and that's what we need to be invited to, and we need to accept that invitation. Robert? Yeah, I'm in um, Sydney Catholic Schools, and my primary responsibility is the faith formation of staff. We have 9,000 staff in that school system, and I have a great team of, of co-workers who um, provide the following, uh, staff meetings, presentations, <coughs> retreats, um, and we also have uh, pilgrimages and immersions, etc. I've seen how we have changed the language so that things like evangelization and mission is now no longer considered uh, you know out there on the right side of things but mainstream now we also have a great uh, endeavor with respect to youth ministry we do a lot of things outside of the classroom for students and i look at this as like uh, bypass surgery. In the classroom, sometimes religious education can be a bit boring, whatever, but we provide events for students outside of that context, and that, you know, gets them alive in the faith. We even take students to World what, Youth what, Day. Yeah, what kind of events are you talking about? Uh, evangelization days, for example. Uh, we get, we ask each school to send 20 students of a particular age, and we have an all-day event, like we had Chris Padgett this year for year nine and 10 students. We do evangelization days for students in years seven and eight, nine and 10. We also have a project called 1010, which is based on John 1010, which is, you know, I've come to give you life and life to the full. And that's actually a response to the call for a pre-marriage catechumenate. So this has introduced you know, over a thousand students in 20 schools to formation in theology of the body. Mm -hmm. and, and doing it in a very exciting way in, at, in the schools and connecting those students to parish and then we have regional events and then we have archdiocesan events. Another area that's really exciting work that we do, we have what's called a family educator in every primary school and they deal with evangelization directly with parents. So we engage over 3,000 parents a week through this program, connecting parents back to parish, back to prayer and back to sacraments. Another area that I'm involved in and been involved in for 28 years is just a small parish-based apologetics group, which is allied with Perusia. And Shabba went to this group over 20 years ago called Lumen Verum Apologetics. And it was founded by just one, as you could say, ordinary laywoman, Arlette Bowen. And that was a determination to provide young adults with authentic teaching in catechetics and apologetics specifically. And we've continued on now for nearly 30 years. And it's my endeavor, my hope that 
groups like this actually expand and that I believe every parish should have an apologetics based type of group like this. The last thing I'll mention is university chaplaincy. Um, I was employed by Cardinal Pell in 2002 to start a Catholic chaplaincy in a very secular university, University of Sydney. And now in 2023, this endeavour has grown to four of the secular universities in the Archdiocese of Sydney. The changes that I've seen have been incredible. Firstly, these centres provide a, 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 an island of sanity and faith in, in the midst of a very secular environment, which is sometimes hostile on university campuses. But I've seen a lot of vocations flow from these chaplaincies, uh, better Catholics, uh, marriages, and over two dozen direct vocations to religious and priestly life. So there are three really big good news stories in the last 20 or so years. And I could elaborate also on men's ministry is mm. booming mm. now. Yep. Among Maronites and, and Roman Catholics, particularly Croatians, big things are happening there. And I see that as a real movement of the Holy Spirit in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th these are uh, a number of important things. I, I think, you know, for instance, again, in this country, probably in Australia as well, uh, apologetics used to be part of formation in all the high schools and univer Catholic universities. But it, it, that changed when ecumenism was seen as, well, we should just learn to get along. And, you know, it that was taken advantage of many anti-Catholic groups of different kinds used that approach, our, our approach of, well, we're not going to try to argue. Uh, that was used as a way to become professionally anti-Catholic. There were, for a number of years, there were professional, about 125 uh, anti-Catholic groups that just were targeting Catholics who couldn't defend themselves. But there's also defending ourselves against these new Marxists, new secularists, atheists who are very aggressive. Um, that, all of that needs to go on because some people's questions are intellectual. Well, Father, the Second Vatican Council was very clear in its decree on the laity, paragraph six, that the laity had the responsibility to defend the faith the Catholic faith and particularly to meet the challenges of the time. And that was in 1965. Mm -hmm. and we know the challenges today are even greater. So yes, the Second Vatican Council gave greater emphasis to ecumenism and to interfaith dialogue, but it did not jettison apologetics. So this was, I think, the serious mistake that much of the church yes. made. They, they, it's not one or the other. And apologetics, I, ha I did a study in new apologetics and new apologetics is really a refocus on 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give a, a reasoned explanation for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and reverence. So there shouldn't be this combative sense. And I look also to what Pope St. John Paul II said in 1999 to the bishops of Western Canada in an ad limina visit. He said, our responsibility is not to win arguments, but to win souls. And and add to that, Pope Benedict said that apologetics is really an act of charity, an act of love when you're trying yeah. to answer the why questions of the other. Yes. And last of all, in, um, Pope Francis said in Evangelii Gaudium, paragraph 132, he called for a need to engage in a creative apologetics, particularly in meeting the great challenges that science, etc., pose for us today. So yes. together, apologetics should be, as you said, once again, normative in the life of parishes, schools, universities, and seminaries. And I, I think the other part of the, that quote that you gave from the document on the laity in Vatican II, it didn't say that the laity are supposed to get a lot of ministries inside the church. Mm. You know, that's mm. what, and what Pope Francis and Pope Benedict have been concerned that there's a certain clericalization of the laity. The lay mm. people are getting more and more roles inside the church. Mm -hmm. 
instead of understanding your mission is actually more outside the church because as the lay lost, people, yeah. <clears throat> you can place. go into yeah. places I'm not allowed. Yeah. Mm. Insurance doesn't allow me to go into a lot of factories, office buildings, shops, and other places where, but the people of God are there. Mm. And there are different ways to witness where we priests can't. And sometimes too many people, especially among the laity, are taking refuge in helping out a church. And there's a lot to be done there, to be sure. But if you're taking refuge and say, well, I'm serving Christ in church, when we need you out there. Yeah. And also lay people can invite people. You know, um, I've been, I'm very involved with Alpha, the Alpha um, movement, which is in lots of different churches. But in the Catholic context, you can invite people to a meal and then you can actually have a short talk and then a discussion about the meaning of life and who is Jesus and what's faith all about and give people an opportunity to encounter Christ. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's called Alpha because it's not the Omega, it's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so having uh, opportunities for lay people to invite friends and family and lapsed Catholics and other people, neighbours, to actually come to something. Um, often you know, a priest... You know, it might be a bit weird for them to, you know, to be just invited by a priest, but lots of lay people have got that network and those contacts that they can invite people to, exactly. to share what we have. If you buy a new car, you want to show it off to everybody. You know, you're all excited about it, but we don't do that with our faith. We've got to be able to get excited about our faith and, and, and share our love for Jesus in a meaningful way that people think, hmm, you know, there's something going on there and I want to have a part of that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we've got to plant seeds all the time yeah. and sharing the why behind the what, but also the invitation to that person. These are the reasons why I believe and I'm inviting you to come and taste and see the goodness of the Lord. You know, this is the whole taste treasure and, um, and, and this is great for them. And it's not us sort of, and maybe, maybe people get the wrong idea of apologetics where it's I'm right, you're wrong. No, it's, yeah. it's not like that. I've discovered the truth. It's changed my life and I want to encourage you to come and discover it with me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you too. Let's discover it together. And I think it's important for all of us to remember there are opportunities throughout life where you can see somebody who looks kind of upset, mm. sad, and, and even worse. And you may have an opportunity to say something to that person that you know just you just see yeah. someplace and start to invite them into the life of the church and i think that kind of constant alertness again this is where jesus wants us to be alert yes. he says stay awake he mm -hmm. doesn't say be woke <laughs> <laughs> you know that's yep. in my bible yeah uh, stay awake <laughs> and always look for those opportunities. I want to let people know throughout the world that uh, you can stay up to date with everything that Perusia Media has to offer. You can do that by going to perusiamedia.com. Perusia Media, and that's P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A media.com. You can also check out their blog, you go there and you find their blog, is called The Narrow Gate. That comes out of my Bible, doesn't right. it? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Jesus said that the gate is narrow that goes to heaven. It's not wide. Uh, it's not easy. And so we want to do that. Thank you all for coming all the way from Australia. I know you've been evangelizing around our country. Thank you for coming to Birmingham and to be with our show. And may the Lord bless all of you on this feast of the, the great St. Nicholas. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can have these guests all the way from Australia and all the other guests that we've had and, and the other programs we do only because this network is brought to you by you. So as Mother said, just please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And if you do that, we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. 
just on this feast of St. Nicholas, don't send us coal. <laughs> God bless you all and thank you.